Meyer, and this is Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse. After 50 years of being a nurse and doing Once a Nurse since 2017, I thought I had a pretty good handle on nursing and the healthcare industry. But these past three years have been eye-opening. What I have learned is that healthcare must change, and I believe it is nurses who are best positioned to lead the industry back to health. This show is dedicated to providing a platform for nurse voices, putting a spotlight on the work that we do, and imagining the future. Today's show, I am welcoming my guest of Dr. Candy Campbell. She is a nurse. She has her own storied career as a clinician, administrator, and academic. But today, our topic is regarding her other amazing career as an award-winning actor, author, and filmmaker. And she's an improv actress who brings to life the words and wisdom of Florence Nightingale. So uh, today's show is called, What Would Florence Say? And please welcome with me, Dr. Candy Campbell to Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse. Thanks, Leanne, great to be with you. Well, thank you, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I've wanted to have this happen for quite a while. So I ask every guest to, um, Share with me how you got to being a nurse and um, how you came to be where you are now. All right. Well, that's we don't have time for the lengthy <laughs> part of that story. But just suffice it to say that when I was in, in uh, high school, you know how you go to the counselor and you talk about what you think you might do. In my day, uh, there were really the glass ceiling for for women was just starting to crack. And pretty much it was secretary, teacher or nurse. And I figured, although I like teaching, I really thought nursing was more adventurous. And so that's what I posited to this counselor. And she said, let's look at your tests. <laughs> And she said, well, you're off the charts in reading comprehension and all of that. But, you know, you're sort of a CB student in math and science. So I don't know if you'd even pass chemistry. So I chose teaching. And while I was in college, sort of fell into acting and wound up with a degree in acting, theater and acting. And then after that, when I was... I was on the way to New York, I'll say, and I had what we used to call a casting couch experience where mm -hmm. a director put the moves on me and I was shocked and pushed him across the room and said, what are you doing? And he said, this is the way the game is played, you know, and I said, not for me. And I walked off that show and I walked out of acting for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And during that time, then I wanted to see the world. I got hired by Pan Am as a flight attendant. <laughs> Flew and around the form world. of nurse. I, well, that's where I got the call to be a nurse. Yeah, we say it was thirty thousand feet up when a lot of people got sick on the on the airplane. Uh, I was uh, ringside to watch the back of a seven forty seven where one hundred and twenty four people vomited in unison. <laughs> oh and, my goodness. Yeah. And I learned that there's two kinds of people that day. Those who run to hide and those that run to help. And I ran to help and my seatmate ran to hide. And <laughs> when it was sort of over, she said, Oh my gosh, can't believe you, you know, could even stand it. And I said, Well, you know, you sort of breathe through your mouth. And and uh besides, if it wasn't so sad that everybody was sick, it was kind of artistic, you know. <laughs> She said, you have that really sick sense of humor. <laughs> you should go to nursing school. And I did. Yeah, that helps a lot, actually. <laughs> it does. Well, that's wonderful. So that got you into nursing. And then how, uh, obviously, because of your acting background, when did you actually start thinking about Florence? Ooh, well... I should say that Florence, the Florence show and Evening with Florence Nightingale is my third solo show. They've all been about nursing and healthcare. And what happened was uh, with the first two, 
uh, I was an improv actor. I had my own improv company uh, there in San Francisco and was that was my side gig as I was full time. I got back into theater after I was divorced in 1992 and, you know, full time the main breadwinner there. So uh, acting and improv was was my lighten up sort of fun side thing. I was doing voiceovers and some other things. I always had a commercial actor when I started, when I changed over. But um, what happened was that after, after I had five foot surgeries and then the doctors said, you'll have to have some sort of modified work. I got into administration Mm-hmm. And after a few years of administration, wishing that somebody would just fall over and clutch their chest so I could do something I knew how to do <laughs> instead of pushing <laughs> papers, you know, yeah. I really miss clinical. And um, then I started back to grad school to become an academic. One of the reasons was just to get back in. I love teaching. I had taught in every hospital that I was ever at. I was an educator. So I wanted to get back formally. And that's, I got the doctorate. And in 2010, when it was, if you recall, Leanne, that was the hundredth year anniversary of Florence Nightingale's passing away. Okay. death. And we had a wonderful, still, she has a wonderful librarian over at the University of San Francisco, uh, Claire Sharifi. She came into a faculty meeting and told us that all of Florence Nightingale's 200 books and articles and over 10,000 of her letters that we have are now being digitized because, you know, of this anniversary. Because that's what we do. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and she said, you know, y'all come and I'll give you the code and you can start reading. And so I started reading and it took me three years. I was hooked on Florence Nightingale. Wow. And so then I was challenged by a friend of mine and National Speakers Association. I had already in 2003 started my speaking career again as a side gig. And um, he said, well, you're a nurse and you've done two solo shows already. Why isn't this the third one? And I said, oh, no, Barry, uh, this, it's just a lot of work and I don't make a lot of money. Um, and he said, but you really you really like it. And he said, what would it take for you to change your mind? And I laughed and I said, you know what? God himself would have to call me. <laughs> and so the next morning at 930, I got a phone call and I hear this is God. <laughs> Do that show. Well, I'll tell you, um, I never had a very close connection with Florence. We, of course, heard about her almost immediately when I started in nursing school. And I, my thought was very arrogant. And why would I want to know about this 150-year-old person? Um, so, And they didn't really give us any information that made her seem fascinating Certainly not that she, you know, the effect of what she had done was following us into current times. So um, I'd like to give our audience just a little piece of of Florence as you depict her. And I believe that we have just a a couple minutes of a clip of you. And I'm hoping that we can put that up. So my producer is busily putting that up and I will prepare to be quiet. I think we can start. Oh, hello! Oh, why, I declare you, you look as surprised to see me as I am to be here. <laughs> I asked my generous host, however did you arrange for me to arrive? They said, simple, there's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> you must understand. In heaven, my body is young and strong. It is pain-free. It's also a size two. (laughs) The date? November 4th, 1854. 3,000 injured lying in this borax used as hospital, then miles and miles of fallen men 
Oh, they were boys, actually. 16 to 22-year-olds, heroes, it was clear. And all those faces, oh, I must switch gear. Switch gear. Well, it was built on a cesspool. That hellhole at Scutari, it contaminated the ground and, and, and the water all around. Predictably enough, enter cholera, our uninvited guest, the pestilence unseen, whom, by the time we arrived, had captured nearly 60% of the lives. Oh, wow, that really brings it. It really brings it into present. Um, I, I've read enough now about that whole Skatari hospital situation that I just feel like I'm my heart is beating and I'm feeling like, which way do I go first? How do I help? <laughs> so uh, that is just amazing. And, and actually, right now, you're about to leave today on a trip <laughs> for a very exciting adventure. Do you want to tell us about that? Exactly. So Miss Nightingale's going off Broadway as of March 7th. That's a Tuesday night, not the greatest night to open on Broadway, but that's what's happening. And right now, that's um, that's that's where we're going. It's Theater Row, which is right on 42nd Street. It's really just a few blocks off Broadway. It's part of the United Solo Theater Festival, one of the most uh, preeminent solo festivals around. It's um, it's a juried festival, so I had to apply to get in and so forth. So it's pretty exciting. We're hoping to connect with lots of nurses in the New York area. Wonderful. Uh, I'm glad you said where it is in New York. So um, we may have to do some getting on the LinkedIn and and reaching out to all of our friends around the area and see if we can uh, get some more people packed into your theater. That would be wonderful. So um, I, I don't even know, let's let's just talk from there. What, what we want you to do or what we're hoping that you can do is join us uh, June 22nd through the 24th for Power Up Nursing. My producer, Tanya Abreu and I have been dreaming about this for three years. And we know what the last three years have been. So uh, it's been a dream. And so we're bringing that dream to life. And we want to invite nurses from all over the country to come and get their, reignite their dreams or find a dream that they've never had before or join somebody else's dream. And so we're hoping that you can come. And this same kind of thing is what we named this show. What would Florence say? I'm envisioning if you as Florence could walk around and answer the questions that all levels, young nurses, you know, middle level nurses and seasoned nurses, what would they ask? And, and what were some of the things you might want to tell them? So do you have some thoughts that maybe already nurses are asking you questions and oh, yeah. share with us? What are some of the things you Oh, answer? yeah. Well, let me just say that part of the show is answering the questions that people put in the basket that's usually in the lobby before the show. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those questions are sort of the, the same ones. But I wanted to just preface the questions by telling you that after I first started doing the show a few years ago, which, you know, I was full time faculty, so I was not doing this a lot. And I was planning I had a tour planned uh, at the beginning of 2020. Yeah, <laughs> and of course. I don't have to tell you the rest. So, um, but it was, what happened was that people kept asking me after the show, do you have anything else? And I'm like, what do you want? And they're, because I had a, a flyer, you know, they're like, no, like a book. So I realized that what I could do uh, that I hadn't thought of doing was that I could take the notes that I had from, you know, once an academic nice. too. Nice. I had, yeah, I had done a qualitative study of this massive amount of reading that it took me three years to do because I, I was having a trouble 
correlating it in my own mind. Mm -hmm. So I did this study. I just started to categorize chunks of her thoughts because, you know, like any great um, thinker, she, she, the same themes keep coming up. And I got six categories. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to write a book. So I'll have the categories be the subtitle. And then I realized, you know, I could probably scrunch two of these. I could actually get it down to three categories. And that, if I might show you, became, oh, yeah. <laughs> became the book channeling Florence Nightingale and the three categories that she wrote all about integrity, insight, and innovation. Boy, do we need that right now? Exactly. Those are the foundational concepts that she based the whole profession on. And there are many, many questions about, about her, her life, why she would even, you know, she was an aristocrat and mm -hmm. the, um, the, the society at the time was definitely, uh, they didn't call it a caste society, but it was. And she worked tirelessly. You know, she was very evangelical in her thought. She, um, even from a, the time that she was a young girl, she and her mother did little charity things. Because, you know, if you've seen pictures of where they lived, it was like Downton Abbey. Yes. You know, and there was a village down there that her family supported with with the work that they were doing. And even at a young age, when they would go around and check on people who were sick and bring them soup and jams and calves foot jelly, you know, th <laughs> things like that. She um, she started thinking deep thoughts as a young girl and questioning her mother about the sort of frivolous in her mind charity yeah. works that they were doing she wanted to do more she wanted really to help them and throughout the course of her life you know she was asking those universal questions at an early age of who am i and why am i here yeah. you know a lot of people don't think of those questions until they're almost dead <laughs> not me i started at five <laughs> there you go questions. You know, she girl. had the same reaction to a crisis as you did in the airplane. She ran to it, not away from it. Yes, indeed. Thank you for that. Well, she she worked so many years even. And here's another thing people don't know. After she conquered the disillusionment of her family who were ready to just disown her for this mad idea she had of becoming what they felt was a menial worker. I mean, yes. it was not done. Well, even less than menial. Oh yeah, I mean, it was. It was not done. Yeah. And um, you know, then she she got this notoriety when she went to the to the uh, hospital uh, that supported the soldiers uh, who had been fighting in the Crimean conflict there in Turkey and Scutari. But uh, aside from that wonderful work that she did and all the, the fame and celebrity that, that came her way. And, you know, she was a rather shy person. So she, she really didn't want it, uh, which is why the subtitle of the show An Evening with Florence Nightingale is called The Reluctant Celebrity. Yeah, she really felt she had a call from God mm -hmm. to make the world a better place. And when she came back from the Crimea, she was so ill. The doctors gave her. Well, first of all, they gave her six months. And then they said, if you last six months, maybe a year. Mm -hmm. So the fact is that she was very nearly invalided most of the next 50 years that she lived. And with pain, right? She was in oh, extreme pain. Extreme. And so mm -hmm. the fact that she was able to make so many huge differences be using her platform. And I think that's really one of the main messages for nurses today is to not be shy, even if you are shy. You know, she found ways with her uh, associations because women couldn't speak in public unless mm -hmm. you're the queen, you know, in those but she days. Was, she did know the queen and she had the queen in her pocket. So that didn't hurt. 
Absolutely. Queen, but Queen, Queen Victoria. Yes, it was. And it was because that she wasn't able to, to directly influence that the queen and her sort of, you know, got head to head and thought of, well, all right. Uh, even though the queen said, I wish you were in the war office, but of course, you know, she couldn't be. Uh, how can we work to better, you know, all of these things that Florence Nightingale um, impressed her because she had an audience with Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. She she went to Balmoral and was there for a few days and uh, they really picked her brain. And so there... Because of that, she she said very often, you know, my enemy is disease and untoward death. Uh, I, she wanted, if you look right now at the 17 development, sustainable development goals of the World Health Organization, hmm. it's all Florence. It really wow. is. Clean air and water, nutritious food. Uh, housing for the poor, education, uh, safe childbirth for women, honorable work for women. She was really a trailblazer. Interesting work that pays commensurate to the work you're doing. Yeah, those kinds of things. Amazing. We actually were just talking about this the other day. One of my other side uh, kicks is um, nursestransformminghealthcare.org, if anybody wants to look it up. But that's what we started with also was seven goals toward health and all, you know, thinking in terms of, oops, I've got to turn off my phone. <laughs> so Whoops. all of those going toward, um, you know, how do we um, make, I lost my train of thought there. So how do we keep going uh, with all of the incentives for health be toward health outcomes, not how much money we can make from it? You know, one of the things that Florence advocated for and that was echoed after the Civil War in the United States and then uh, in Britain and many other countries, uh, that we need to resurrect this idea that the hospital should just be an intermediate stop, that people best recover at home with their family, in their surroundings, you know, in the best case, and not everybody has, um, you know, a uh, family to be around, but that is comfortable for them. If you can help with, you know, light and air and color and flowers, you know, she really understood the environmental impact on health and well being. You know, absolutely. I'm thinking we could actually go a little longer than we normally would go. And I'm kind of thinking I want to do that if that's a possibility. You bet. Yeah. So um, there's just so much with this. Um, uh, talk about, well, talk a little bit about what she, the, the disease that she had. She actually got it in, um, in um, my brain went dead here. In Crimea. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, when she yeah, was yeah, at yeah. the very hospital, right? Well, you know, a lot of people don't know that the hospital she was at, you know, it was by ship, you know, it was quite a long ways away because it was in Turkey. But because towards the end, um, there, there's lots of, there's so much intrigue that was going on. But, you know, they had, um, they had kind of mash units, if you can think of it that yes. way. Mm -hmm. They had other ancillary hospitals that then fed into the big one at Scutari. But you had to have people that were a couple of miles away from the conflagration in order to process them and take care of them, you know. So what happened was some, um, she, wa she was having a bit of a um, crosshairs with, um, one group of Irish nuns who were running some uh, two of these mass units. And um, the war office had given her authority to, you know, to be an authority, to set policy and everything, you know. Um, and they, they railed against that. <clears throat> they said, you know, we've been in this game longer than you have. And, you know, they, they didn't want to be under anybody. <clears throat> so, but the British 
uh, you know, it's a big institution. Yeah. So it needed to have some sort of hierarchy in theirs. But anyway, what she did was she decided she's going to go on a tour. And, you know, when you mean go on a tour in those days, that means yeah. you take a boat, you go like eight days across the water, then you get there and it's by mule or horse. And she was a little woman. She wasn't a big gal. And it, you know, there wasn't a lot of good food. Every, I mean, everybody, if you look at the pictures, there were a lot of derogatypes of um, what the soldiers looked like, what the men looked like. And, and the one famous picture that we have of her, um, that her mother arranged for this portrait setting after she came back, she had lost about 30 pounds and she was pretty much skin and bone, but she had a kind of a balloon sleeve dress. She doesn't look quite as, as small as she was, but she was really embarrassed. She had big circles under her eyes because she felt so ill. And that's where she got this what they finally decided they'd call it Crimean fever. There were really about six different diagnoses of different fevers that they were trying to diagnose. And remember, uh, bacteriology wasn't even a real science then. Things were right. just beginning to percolate on that realm. They were still thinking of miasma as, um, you know, the, the way. The air uh, and the. Right. Yeah. Not, not, and we know now that that, you know, infectious right. disease does get passed by air. But anyway, Point being, she didn't want to, she wanted, and I think this is key in, in what she did and what we can learn, because the, the strife with these nuns had happened via mail, that she never met them in person. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm going to go over there and, and meet them. We're nurses. We are on the same page. We need not to have this strife. Mm -hmm. And she did. And that's what happened. She created a relationship with them. They had a chance to talk, you know, but after that, she got so sick. Now, today, we would probably, they say, she might have had a combo of problems. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of them would be brucellosis based on some of the symptoms that she suffered from. And it's so sad because we have antibiotics that would cure mm -hmm. that now. Um other people say, well, it sounds like she might have had chronic fatigue, too. Well, uh, I don't Logically, deny that. I have had it. I would bet that's it, it, partly because she probably wasn't getting a lot of sleep. And no. part of chronic fatigue is you don't sleep. So exactly. what, one thing I'd like to get into is um, I'm so fascinated by the idea of this little woman, mm -hmm. you know, coming amongst the war generals who have been fighting wars for ever <laughs> since the beginning of time. And, and the whole concept of soldiers was basically cannon fodder. And there was always more. They could just bring more people in from wherever they found them in yeah. whatever gutter or whatever and bring them in. And so there wasn't really much in the way of trying to save them. If they had been uh, shot, yeah, you know, so what? You know, you die, you live, whatever. And if you live, we're going to put you back out there. Well, I think that the British government didn't have quite that callous a thought about it. But I'll tell you what, not too many miles away from Scutari Hospital, there was a French hospital. And the French, being uh, at the time a highly Catholic nation, had employed the Sisters of Charity, the nuns. And you know, the nuns know how to clean. And they they had their own training, forms of training. And th there was one letter that was published in the London Times that got her attention. And um, Sidney Herbert, who was the minister of war, got his attention at the time. It was uh, a letter from a soldier who, that got picked up that had... Um, had been in the field and uh, observed that the Sisters of Charity uh, were right there and that their hospital, they got care in a way and that for whatever reason, I guess this was a not just a regular soldier, I think he was an officer who had some reason to look at or go into the Sisters of Charity's uh, barracks and see how they were how those men were doing and it was it was 
lovely. And he kept, and he wrote, you know, why don't we have the Sisters of Charity here? And that is the letter that uh, sparked Sidney Herbert to say, well, we don't really have that because we're not a Catholic nation per se, mm -hmm. but um, we have, we have, they had never had ladies other than some sort of tag along ladies, if you know what I mean. You know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> Who were helping out. So this was a big difference. They, they scoffed against ladies being at war. Mm -hmm. But then she had the, I don't know, chutzpah or whatever to be able to stand up to these generals who basically were saying, that's too expensive. You want to clean up, have a clean area, have uh, food that is healthy, uh, carry away waste, have people that, you know, are, are taking care of all these things. I, I believe there's some pictures of men just kind of on straw. and Or that, or, or nothing. Or nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straw, if they were lucky, there weren't any beds or, you know, furniture and such. So it was, it was really dire. And uh, not only that, you know what, a lot of people don't know. They think, oh, well, she invented all this. Well, not really. You know, she had studied hospital and healthcare administration during the time. There was a 10 year time that she was not allowed to go to nursing school, which she wanted to do. And her parents would not support that. They would not let her out. No, no, no. But her dad, um, he said, you know, uh, I'll let you study the administration. You know, that he could justify. Mm -hmm. And she went all over Scotland and Wales. And she visited Ireland twice and, um, and, and wherever in England that she could go for, for basically 10 years taking notes. And then after that time, she got her first position as a nurse, got swiftly um, uh, into the administration part after she performed so well there because she she was so full of this knowledge of how to do things. And, and yeah, she was- Nobody um, else knew what to do. Well, Again, it was it was not a profession like we know today. I, there were doctors who came in and diagnosed and nurses did their best to carry out the orders. But uh, and, you know, cleanliness being next to godliness in all ways, we knew about that. But see, before the war, she was the the association that she had there in the um, hospital for um, gentle women who were in unforeseen circumstances. Uh, read between the lines. Not uh, married. Was, yeah, was uh, <laughs> laying in hospitals, as they say. Yeah. Um, cholera came to London. At that very time when she was a superintendent and the the people who were the mayor of London, uh, etc., she was asked because the hospitals were being overrun if they would convert a wing of that hospital. And, and she said, of course, you know, and she knew just what to do. And but she had the benefit of the cleanliness and, you know, the policies that were already in place that she just, you know, straightened up. And then came, uh, a year or so later, came the call to go to the front, or not the front, but Scutari. Yeah. She was ready. She was <clears> at ready. that point, she had done all. And that's the amazing thing is, I don't know how many times, and there has to be other people than me, that you feel like everything in your life has led you to this moment. And, <laughs> um, you know, certainly not while you're going through it that you had any idea of that, but certainly when all of a sudden you find yourself in the right place at the right time with the right skills and you're thinking, oh, that's what that was all about. Exactly. Yeah. So um, she uh, actually had like a, a building was, I don't know if it was built or if she just took over a building and then they set up um, uh the building had a floor. They had beds that were put into it. Wait a minute. Um, where are you talking about? Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. That was a hundred year old building that had been built as a stables okay. by some sultan or other. Okay. And the British army leased it. Okay. And turned it into barracks. And it was huge. Yeah. And so she, she took the 
barracks and cleaned it up. And that was where then instead of laying on, on filth and straw and in whatever clothes they had on and no way to carry away waste, that was the opportunity then to have them in a better spot. And I know, um, that those soldiers who, who did survive and went back to Great Britain were forever, her fan is not the word. I think they um, just worshiped her. Oh, absolutely. Her and supported her. And even when she died, I've heard that um, any of those men that were still around would came out for her funeral. Yeah, yeah. You know, they wanted to inter her in St. Paul's Cathedral and she wouldn't have it. You know, because she was she was old and sick for five years before she died. She mm -hmm. was pretty much bedridden then. Mm -hmm. um, and she wouldn't have it. That's why, you know, she's buried in East Willow. And all it says is F dot N dot on her. Really? Marker. Wow. Yeah. Again, she she said, I'm only a testimony to how one woman ordinary she called herself an one ordinary woman plus god can do can can change the world and yes. she she realized that the people that she met the experiences that she met or that she had like you say all sort of culminated that she was uh, a cog in a bigger wheel and it wasn't because she was all that what she was, as she um, she said very often, that she wanted to hear the words, welcome thou good and faithful servant, that she had had a mission and she carried it out to the best that she could. And I think all of us who are in nursing, if, we, if we're doing it for the right reason, if we are wanting to make a difference in this world, that's the way we feel. That's why you heard that some of the, the nurses during the pandemic were saying, don't call us heroes. Yes, exactly. Um, when you were just talking, what came to my mind is that the difference between an ordinary person and an extraordinary person is um, passion attached to mission. Mm, I like that. And, and that seems to strike me for uh, what I call nurses, right, yeah. nurses are those people who it's almost like, you know, authors talk about, and maybe you feel this, that you can't not write. And I think for a nurse's nurse, you can't not help. So like you in, in the airplane, you know, everybody's vomiting and you're thinking, wow, this is kind of amazing. And what can I do to help? And, you know, many other people were, would love to have gone in the other direction. So um, if there's one thing, we're, um, I think maybe about 10 minutes we have left. Uh, one thing that you especially would want people to know about Florence that might inspire us now in the time period that we've just gone through. I mean, I feel like this was something that will go down in history. This will be written about for another 100, 150 years. And we were part of it in whatever way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that she might have said to us that could encourage people now, especially now as we come out of it a bit? Oh, there's more than one thing. But one of the things that she had said was don't waste a crisis opportunity because as she confided to the queen, she never would have met the queen. She never would have been able to do as much as she was able to do, which, you know, she was an advisor then. The queen sort of <laughs> gave her the, um, the uh, agency to be the ad hoc advisor. She, you know, the queen would, whenever there was a viceroy of India or something like that, anybody who was set out, you know, remember the sun didn't set on the British yes. Empire at the time. Yes. And, you know, it's not, it wasn't a, a without problems, but that because she was such an ecumenical advocate for people, for mm -hmm. population mm -hmm. health, she was not a person who was, um, <clears throat> what 
um, you might say, a colonialist in the worst way. She yeah. was not a racist, which I know has I've been oh, yeah. reading. It's it, it. She's she's the antithesis of that. She just wanted that we should work for the good of all humankind. Mm -hmm. And certainly as a woman, she um, at first was not behind the sorts of, uh, she called them shenanigans that the um, suffragettes were up to. She was old school, you know, she, she believed in the power of the pen and she would never have, well, she wasn't well enough to do any marches or, or that. And she said, I like food too much to, <laughs> to, go, to go on hunger strike. But mm. on the other hand, she was sort of the poster child for women's lib because she did stand up. And when she she wrote about how her disillusionment of, and the, the whole sort of evolution of her personality. You know, as a young girl, she was disillusioned with the fact that women's lives who were in this upper class, they were just wasted. She saw people just, you know, having servants wait on them and just doing nothing with their lives, with their brains, you know. Women weren't allowed in university and her father said that, you know, he he understood she had a keen mind and he allowed her a lot of education. So I think part of the getting back to the point of the pandemic is to to use the crisis, because in, if you look in history now, every single war that we've ever had in terms of medicine, we've had wonderful innovations. And that's how we grow as um as an industry in the healthcare industry, if you will. I don't mean to say industry, I mean healthcare. It is. That's what it's become as an industry. I mean it in, in the way that it's 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 a larger uh involvement of people, not in the capitalistic way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to make use of the situation, you know, strike while the iron is hot. People are desperate for new ideas. And this is a great time, a great time for innovation, because now we've come to the wall. We've survived this and we know now what we lacked. And that's Miss Nightingale wrote a lot about the lessons that she learned. Mm -hmm. By the way, she wrote 820 pages. Oh my goodness. Just on the revolution of um, it's a long title, but it was the the document that the Queen asked her to write to give to the War Office so that they could revamp the whole British Army hospital system. Well, I can just envision the War Office when this 800 page <laughs> book came to them and they said, okay, everything you've been doing, we want you to redo it, you know, <sighs> and follow this. Yeah. I can just imagine. They must and it was full worked. of tables and statistics. And, and that is why, by the way, a little side note, she was so influential in not just that Rose diagram that we know of the statistical analysis, but when she was, um, dealing with, um, you know, the queen assigned her to work with one of her mentors, William Farr uh, and Quintilette, the, these these uh, masters of statistics at the time, because she had been there and they had not. And she was collating this data that had come in and she was uh, creating some of the data, a lot of it she she created herself. So she knew how to fine tune and, and, and how to, um, to make these tables. And, and so she, she went head to head with the statisticians when she was making this treatise because they said, well, we'll just put all these appendices here and we'll just have all the data here and it'll be in a table. And she said, you don't know these, <laughs> you don't know these people. <laughs> they are not going to look at that. Yeah. You better dumb exactly. it down and make it about a sixth grade level, put <laughs> it in pictures. And she's the one. And that... we need to come to an end here. Yeah. But um, uh, I see that uh, Tanya has just put up your website. 
And I'm wondering on the website, can they also get the book that you mentioned that you're writing or have yes. written? It's, it's yes. almost publishing. Yes. Florence um, Nightingale Live. And I assume it's going to be on Amazon and wherever yeah. else people want to buy books. Yeah. So that's very important. Um, I'm hoping that we can get lots of interest for your show that you're doing on the 7th of March. I think this actually might come out after that time, but I'm going to start <laughs> writing people. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm hoping is that um, people can, that you for one can come to the Power Up Nursing in June 22nd through the 24th in Orlando, Florida. And I hope people will check that out. Um, Tanya just put that up. Um, my vision of you there is that you could come in costume and speak to nurses, old, you know, current people, young people, all of the people that are trying to process what they've just been through. If they could come, I, I almost envision a, a button that says, ask me anything. Ah, and, ah that sounds, and, uh, we'll have to put our heads together. Yeah. I think we can that. come up with some fun things. So uh, in all, I absolutely believe in what Florence was saying. I think that nurses are in the best position because we are at the bedside, because we are the ones that held the hands and talked to the, the families. And we did all of those things with not much knowledge about what it was we were dealing with, at least to begin with. Mm. I think that nurses are in a perfect position and I hope that, you know, so many nurses, as i am been a nurse for 50 years, and so many times I found nurses um, diminishing what we do. Oh, I'm just a nurse. Mm -hmm. Or um, I don't do anything, you know, really big. And yet we do the most important thing. Maybe with the exception of mothers who are raising children, I think nurses do incredible things in those times when people feel like, they they don't know where to look. They don't have hope. And that look or that touch or that word that that nurse says makes all the difference. Now is the time we need to go back to finding how we can be healthy, how we can help other people be healthy. And I think nurses are the people to do it. I'm hoping. So I hope lots of nurses join us and come to that same conclusion. So I can only thank you. I have wanted you to be on for a long time. I'm thrilled to have you. I love these kind of stories. So thank you so much. We My will pleasure. look it's at great. maybe having you on again, maybe at the, the conference in Florida. That sounds good. That sounds thank good. We'll do it. Thank you. And this has been Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse. And we will return.